My name is Matthew Hotel, I'm a principal at uh, UTO. We are architects and planners. Um, we were hired by the EDIC to uh, sort of move forward the waterfront plan and to update the, uh, the previous waterfront plan and to advance a uh, municipal harbor plan amendment. Um, this is our second public meeting. We got very good public feedback at the first meeting that we are beginning to incorporate into our strategy. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I will present a little bit where we are, um, a little bit of the sort of regulatory and procedural context of what we're up to, uh, and then you let you know a little bit about where we're going um, uh, in the future. Uh, I'm joined by Andrew Namias uh, from our office, um, who has been doing a lot of work in this plan and whom I will turn to occasionally for a detail that I don't know the answer to. Um, what we are, uh, where we are right now, is we're at this, this second public meeting. Um, there will be a, an official third public meeting as part of the Waterfront Master Plan update. Uh, what we have officially embarked on since uh, we last met is that we are folding a Municipal Harbor Plan amendment into this process. That Municipal Harbor Plan amendment hasn't officially started yet. Um, we are corresponding with CZM about um, the terms of the notice to proceed and some of the procedural details. Uh, but suffice it to say, we will be uh, introducing some of those Municipal Harbor Planning content, uh, concepts and explaining to you uh, what a Municipal Harbor Plan is. Um, our next possible public meeting, which might be in January or early, sometime in early 2019, uh, might be an official municipal harbor plan kick up, kick off, and then the subsequent meeting we might combine the two. So what we're trying to do is to integrate these two uh, planning processes. The municipal harbor plan has a very distinct um, set of procedural requirements, but we're trying to integrate these two as much as possible so that A, we have an integrated plan, um, and B, we can sort of proceed in a, in a good sort of timely fashion and make the most use, quite frankly, of public engagement. So uh, a little introduction, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, this is the Lynn Municipal Harbor Plan. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna sort of be building in this Municipal Harbor Plan uh, amendment into our overall waterfront uh, master plan. Uh, which, uh, which we've been looking at economic development strategies, coastal resil resiliency, um, draft open space master plan, um, and so forth. Um, so a little background, uh, a municipal harbor plan is really uh, a plan that allows a municipality to customize, if you will, uh, waterfront access rules that um, are applied by the state. So there are some very, uh, there's a, uh, chapter 91 is this sort of governing law, and uh, what a waterfront plan allows a municipality to do is to say that we would like to comply with the law, but we want to do it in this special way because um, it will um, <coughs> comply better with the spirit of the law, enable the, the city to develop in a unique way. It's, it's essentially a sort of customization process. Um, the last municipal harbor plan in Lynn was in 2010. Um, about every 10 years, um, approximately, most municipalities do an amendment to that plan to sort of refresh it based on what's happened and based on sort of some of the lessons learned from development. Um, so we're coming up a little bit on that 10 year, and so this seemed like an improper time to, to revise it. Um, what the amendment can do is help us really coordinate this uh, state level regulation uh, with some possible revisions to the zoning and other sort of planning goals that we have specifically for the waterfront. Um, chapter 91 is, a, is the law that governs the waterfront access. Um, it's depicted here in purple 
on this plan. Uh, and what it is basically area that uh, essentially has been previously filled. So these are, these are filled, uh, filled areas that um, essentially become part of the state's jurisdiction of a series of state level laws that have uh, for centuries allowed access to the water and use of the water. And what we're seeing now in chapter 91 is the modern incarnation of some very old laws that uh, govern waterfront access, um, public access, uses, uh, things of this nature. Um, in addition, uh, Inside of Chapter 91, many municipalities have what is called a designated port area. Um, and these are areas within Chapter 91 jurisdiction that are, uh, in a sense, reserved for uh, water-dependent industrial uses, um, which could include things like um, shipping facilities, ferries, uh, uh, in, the, in, in our case, um, the wastewater treatment plant is considered a water dependent use because it relies on the water. Uh, the integrated facility is also considered a water dependent use because uh, the, its infrastructure goes in and out uh, of the water. Um, it's basically a law that is designed to preserve some of these areas for critical industrial uses so that they don't get completely used up by private development. Um, one of the challenges of a DPA, as they're called, is that <clears throat> there aren't often uh, viable uses that need those spaces. And um, sometimes there are other kinds of pressures uh, for using that, that land. Um, they are also incompatible with recreational open space uses, which is another challenge that we hope to sort out over the upcoming months. Um, the, DPA in our waterfront area is really right through the middle of the site here. Um, so <clears throat> it does include some uses that will probably not go, go away, including part of the wastewater treatment and the in-grid uh, plant. But the former landfill, which would be, is currently, we're hoping, will be part of a kind of larger open space network, uh, is something that we need to sort out. Uh, we got a lot of excellent feedback at the last public meeting. Uh, a lot of very good ideas. I would say they are generally characterized by a desire to see really good uh, waterfront access and open space. Uh, lively mixed use destinations in this area. Um, public open spaces. Um, and expansion of water transportation and activities on the water. Um, these are all the kinds of things um, that you would expect to see, but they helped, in a sense, give a little bit of specificity to how we begin to create a kind of revised, implementable vision for the waterfront. Uh, I'd say one of the overriding concerns is how do we ensure that the development, the change, the creation of open space on the waterfront here uh, is truly for everyone in Lynn. Uh, how do we make sure that it's publicly accessible, that the benefits to the changes on the waterfront, including public and private development, um, essentially benefit everyone from Lynn and not just a select handful of <coughs> residents who might happen to be living down in the area. Um, these two things really gave us, I think, a lot of guidance, and I would characterize um, you know, really the high, high level takeaways that I think we want to move on um, are again, ensuring that all the development here in some way benefits uh, residents of Lynn through um, accessibility and other kinds of uh, amenities that we might provide. Um, and then the other is how do we balance um, uses that are might not all be the same? Uh, how do we balance residential development, job creation, which might include also some light industrial uses, uh, and open space, um, with some of the existing industrial uses, such as the wastewater treatment plant, in a way that provides a kind of interesting, lively, mixed-use destination. Um, it's a tall order, but we have some very good precedents for it.
Um, anyway, we think that these are these are very good set of guidance that came out of our first public meeting, and we'll continue to have this this conversation. Um, it's really given rise to what we call our early conceptual framework, um, and I'll go into it in more detail, but. Um, generally speaking, it goes a little bit like this, which is that at the core of our district, uh, in this sort of bluish, purpley area, <clears throat> we have some um, fairly significant industrial uses. We have the wastewater treatment plant, we have some of the end grid facilities, um, we have the uh, Department of Public Works facility. There's, there's a few things down there that are not likely to go away in any time soon. Um, overlaid on top of that, we are building on, uh, so, so in a way our plan is, attempts to be a little bit realistic about the semi-permanence of some of those uses. Um, we are overlaying on top of that plan and really, and on top of that industrial area, and really prioritizing um, the framework that was very well detailed in the public, uh, the, the waterfront open space plan, which, um, is almost complete and may be ratified officially very soon. Um, but that plan identified a very achievable and attractive set of open spaces and connections um, that would allow people access to the water. Uh, it would allow some connections through the designated port area. You're not allowed to have open space in the designated port area, but you are allowed to have certain kinds of access. Um, it identified a series of strategic links that would allow this district to be an attractive open space destination with a series of open space amenities that um, had different kinds of characters. Um, and then from that framework, we're going to overlay this idea of gradual um, mixed use growth, which really begins with some residential uses that are already beginning to occur or be proposed at the north and the south end of the site um, and might grow to the north and the south depending on market demand um, and might eventually feather into some light industrial or other sorts of um, attractive job creating kinds of uses um, in the middle uh, along the Linway edge buffered by some interesting mixed use. So this is a kind of a a guiding framework, how we see some of these mixed uses uh, working together and growing together and being pieced together in a way that um, can, be, can be incremental and still achieve some of the benefits that, that we desire. So again, looking into more detail, that central industrial core um, that I mentioned, again, we need to be realistic, it's there, we can't ignore it. Um, the open space network plan that I mentioned, um, which identifies key uh, corridors for improvement. It identifies uh, very achievable uh, waterfront access ways, um, both at the north end and at the south. It identifies a large uh, open space in the middle that could possibly be created on top of a landfill uh, for which there are plans to be capped. Um, even with, uh, let's call it a very first phase of residential development, we think that there's some really great public benefits that come into play. So um, the North Harbor site, um, I believe, is beginning to get some of the permits that it's required and may begin uh, construction at some point in the not too distant future. Um, that's an opportunity for some to create really a kind of a waterfront loop, if you will, that would go all the way from the North Harbor site through the um, clock tower site to the ferry terminal site and back around. And so you can see that even with one development, we be can begin to accrue some open space benefits that are slightly better or greater than the sum of its parts. Um, the same is true in the south. Um, there are some developments that have been, pro been proposed for a couple of sites down at this end. Um, the development of those sites would have to provide some measure of public accessibility along the waterfront. Um, there's already some discussion and some planning that's happened in the open space master plan about uh, upgrades to the access and the pathways to the fish pier. 
Um, and what you might begin to see in that scenario is, again, another kind of really attractive open space loop that would get you to the fish pier um, and provide a nice place, even before everything else fills in. So very, very important, I think, as a uh, waterfront open space master plan update is to begin to think very realistically about what sequence development occurs and how the public can accrue benefit along the way. Uh, and so looking into the future, uh, not immediately because there isn't quite frankly enough uh, market demand for change in the middle of the site here, but in the future it's very possible that we could, uh, the residential development could expand and we could see some buffered mixed uses, particularly uh, we think about the, the Gorelick site is one of the largest sites there um, that might gradually transition into, again, some nice light industrial uses or other kinds of uses that really support business, that support jobs, um, that might be legacy businesses of the kinds of businesses that are already there. So this is a little bit the framework that we see, and we see a little bit the order that we're going to be moving in from the north and south, uh, and looking long term, the benefits accrue uh, in the middle here. Um, somewhere along the way, we think there's also an opportunity to provide some measure of better connectivity across the Linway at some of the key connections, um, like commercial. Um, we, our team is looking into infrastructural upgrades that are already happening to see if there's any way that we could dovetail what we're doing with some work that might already be taking place. Um, this is all about thinking about ways that we can provide some more near-term improvements about crossing the Linway um, and not really just wait for DCR to have the money to pay for an entire upgrade to the entire Linway which is probably realistically a few years off. Um, so we are looking at ways that we could either combine some of these, these smaller efforts um, with development that's already taking place, or whether we could piggyback those on some other kinds of public grants or, or other state monies that might help us um, make those incremental improvements. Um, we have been asked to look into uh, the various public benefits that residential development could possibly offer in this district. Uh, Pam McKinney, who is our uh, economic development consultant, uh, has a lot of experience understanding this market, has run a lot of performas, uh, is not optimistic that residential development in this particular area can support any meaningful inclusionary uh, affordable housing on its own. Um, there is possibility for affordable housing to occur here, but at the current kind of market conditions, some level of subsidy will be required. Um, this is a longer conversation probably citywide about inclusionary zoning policy. I know that um, the mayor is very interested in it. Um, the city has started to look at this issue in earnest. Um, at the moment, the model says maybe not quite yet here, uh, but I want to stress that citywide this issue is probably not closed. This conversation has probably just begun. We do believe that there is room for, for some significant public benefit in the form of open space access and other kinds of ways of creating uh, uh, open space that is publicly accessible. So at a minimum, some of these waterfront properties, uh, it, it will be required as part of their Chapter 91 licensing. Waterfront uh, access and certain amounts of open space will be required by the state. Uh, what we're hoping to do is to think about ways to um, make sure that those spaces are attractive ones, that they are actually publicly accessible uh, in, in, in spirit and in fact. Um, and that they're attractive, which is what I think has been identified as part of the goals of the open space plan. Um, so we will be working on ways to ensure that that is something that, that, again, accrues as part of this plan. And we think in terms of what development in this area can sort of 
give off that uh, providing that kind of public benefit of public accessibility is um, probably the best bang for our buck in the near future. Um, maybe some of you are already uh, familiar with some of the other developments that are occurring here that the, um, the North Harbor site um, is already have, has plans to provide some pretty robust um, open space connectivity in the form of a kind of harbor walk that will um, connect to, we hope, a future additional harbor walk along the, the clock tower site. Um, these connections, excuse me, were envisioned, again, as part of the open space plan, um, are required as part of their chapter 91 licensing. Um, and so uh, they're evidence that this kind of, uh, this level of benefit um, is feasible here. Um, South Harbor, uh, there are discussions underway, again, that came out of the open space plan um, with DCR to improve the connection to the fish pier, um, to clarify this entrance, to create a, a, a more clearly and attractive, uh, publicly accessible way to get there. Private development would, in theory, continue that loop, which is a nice idea. Um, and then the park as well is also part of that, that sort of plan. So uh, we do believe that really good public space and public accessibility is possible here. Um, Lynn has a lot of waterfront access um, and a lot of really good waterfront access, particularly if you include uh, the beach in the Haunt, Revere Beach, and then of course the, the um, uh, Lynn Shore Drive is really one of the great sort of waterfront walkways. Um, I think the abundance of this kind of waterfront connectivity asks us what should be different about our waterfront. Um, it's a different kind of place. It's got a different history. Um, it's got different uses, uh, some of which are not going away. And so I think the question that we want to ask in this, in this harbor plan is how can we create a space that's not only attractive and exciting and is a great destination, but one that um, is different from some of these other uh, waterfront assets that we have. Um, a couple of really good precedents. Uh, East Boston, uh, the marina in East Boston uh, is a place that I think used to be just a marina. It's sort of evolved into a kind of complex of buildings that support cultural uses, restaurants, uh, artists, and still a lot of the industrial uses and character associated with boat maintenance. Um, it's also part of a, a larger um, uh, an emerging and strengthening network of open spaces, um, some of which have been mandated by Chapter 91. So we think that this is actually a really good precedent. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to K.O. Pies. There's a delicious uh, meat pies, Australian meat pies. The ICA has opened um, a kind of branch outpost across the harbor. Um, uh, there is a uh, cider brewery. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, artist spaces and other things that are going on there on, in addition to some of those uses that are a little bit more industrial in character. So we think that something like this is actually a really good model. It will take time. This particular set of uses really has only come together at probably in the last 12 months, if you really want to name it. But these, these uses can evolve if there is a vision and a goal and a demand for those things. Um, there's a, a warehouse mixed reuse in Union Square in Somerville, same thing. Uh, a series of ex existing buildings um, that now support breweries, maker spaces, smaller scale, scale retail. Um, these uses may be a little ways off, but it's good to have that goal um, and to think about what is really possible here in terms of uses that can support both jobs, light, light scale industrial uses, and provide really nice destination spaces. Um, and then I think one of the really important things about this district that we can really control, or at least have as a goal, is to improve the connectivity around the site. 
There was a series of uh, roadways and streets, some of which extend from the, the city fabric to the north, some of which run sort of northeast, uh, southwest. Um, we think it's very important that we set guidelines so that the development provides uh, appropriate edges. And the value of appropriate edges is that they are a way of signaling to people that these streets are now public. Um, and strangely, the proximity of the development, the more formalizing of a streetscape, is what signals to people that this is a place that is publicly accessible. This is not just a kind of semi-private uh, development driveway, but this is really a street. A lot of those streets are very public, and they've been closed off for many, many years uh, for various reasons. And so you walk down today, and you don't know if you're supposed to go any further. It looks a little sketchy. Um, you don't know if it's private or public, or if it's dangerous or what. Um, Development and how we shape its relationship to those public ways can be a really crucial way that we ensure uh, that the waterfront is not only is accessible, but that actually seems that way. Um, so some high level views. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are some proposals uh, for the South Harbor part of the site, um, as well as at the north. Uh, which is probably further along. Um, and as I mentioned, that these are opportunities to begin to allow people access to different parts of the waterfront. Um, what I really like about improvements to the Fish Pier area, and this as a kind of loop, which is a, quite a long loop, by the way. Um, if you were to arrive here with your dog, this would be a really, really nice walk, for instance, um, is that this is a unique kind of waterfront landscape that isn't available somewhere else in Lynn. Um, it has a unique history, it's been filled, um, it has a kind of an industrial past which provides some of the animation of the landscape. And um, this could be a really beautiful place that can coexist with some private development and in fact be enhanced by its proximity. Um, the same in the north, as I mentioned, um, improvements to the waterfront park here, the waterfront access, um, connections through the ferry terminal, again, begin to see um, a series of connections. If we begin to connect the dots, uh, we begin to have nice destinations. Um, and then as this fills in, uh, what we might begin to hope for is that some of those mixed use kinds of waterfront buffer uses that I was describing might begin to fill in some of the middle views. Um, there is a lot of quite viable industrial uses that um, occupy the middle of the site. Um, those are businesses, they've been in the city for a while. Um, they are likely to stay there so long as their business model is viable. And we need to find ways to integrate those kinds of uses with maybe newer job creating uses, other kinds of retail, things that might be different and also compatible. Um, and then finally, um, what we hope eventually will come here, which is the Harbor Park, which is um, something that was envisioned as part of the open space plan. Um, it's a vision to turn this landfill uh, into a publicly accessible park. Um, it is not as crazy as it sounds. Um, there are plans, engineering plans underway to cap that landfill with additional fill to make it safe. Um, beyond that, We'll have to wait for funds. Uh, what else is new? But there are ample precedents across the Commonwealth of landfills that have been converted to really beautiful, attractive public parks, <coughs> some of which support uh, recreational activity like soccer fields and so forth, some of which are just nice uh, pathways. Um, what I love, again, to this point about how can we make this district unique, what I love about the landfill is that the one place on the waterfront where we actually we actually might have a hill. And the view from up there, particularly after it's been capped and it's even taller than it is now, um, might be just that kind of reason to get yourself down there and to experience that, that view and to have a different kind of waterfront experience than you would, let's say, uh, on Lynchor Drive. Um, so, uh, 
to conclude, and then we can have questions and discussion, um, I think it's really important to understand what this plan can do and uh, what it can't. Um, and I think these are really the most powerful tools that we have for implementation. First is, is zoning, uh, which will need to be uh, <coughs> considered and voted upon by the city council. Uh, but how can we recraft some of the zoning regs that are in this district to um, both encourage, enable, and to control development in a way that is consistent with this vision? Um, the Municipal Harbor Plan Amendment is another one of these tools that I mentioned. Um, this is a very powerful one. Um, it's a simple set of rules, and we will, I hope, make it a little bit simpler, a little bit clearer, but it's a very powerful one because it sticks. And um, it will require some consistency with the zoning, um, and it will also require uh, that those who want to develop along the waterfront will have to provide certain measures of open space and public accessibility. So as I mentioned, if we get the MHP on our side and aligned, um, that's a very powerful tool that we have. Um, uh, the open space plan is a, again, it's almost been ratified. That is also a very powerful tool that we already have. Um, it will be the thing that enables and encourages um, state level investment from entities like DCR. Um, it will provide some guidance uh, for the MHP. Um, and uh, it demonstrates a kind of consistency of vision that I think that we can build upon. And um, it will provide a reference point um, for when development occurs, what kinds of standards we want to see, um, how we want our open space to be crafted. Um, and then finally, uh, what we can do right now is to coordinate with efforts that might already be underway. So uh, National Grid is um, doing some work, some relocating of some of their facilities on their property. Uh, water and sewer is also, um, I think they're replacing a large piece of infrastructure. Um, there is some private development that's going on. Um, there are some early uh, improvements, transportation planning going on, terms some bicycle <coughs> access, improvements along the Linway. Um, all of these things are going on. Um, one of the things, again, and one of the tools in our toolkit is that now we can um, begin to have these entities talk to each other to get these things into alignment and to make sure that our zoning, our municipal harbor plan uh, amendment, our open space plan, all these things are beginning to align in a way that will allow for implementation. Um, so our next steps um, will be a meeting again early 2019, sometime January, February, I hope. Um, that will be uh, what we hope will be our first official public kickoff of the municipal harbor planning amendment. Um, the subsequent meeting, we hope to recombine um, the waterfront planning effort with the municipal harbor planning effort and, and to make it a sort of uh, integrated, integrated process from there. Um, and uh, if you want to see any updates, uh, this presentation, I believe, will be posted on the EDIC, EDIC website uh, for anyone who wants reference to reference it or to share it. Um, and uh, I think we're open to any questions or comments. Um, I don't know how long we have this space, but uh, we have certainly have long enough to answer some questions and to hear some comments. Yes. Uh, my name is Calvin Anderson. I'm a member of the Lynn Historical Commission. And I moved to town 18 years ago on the waterfront, and our waterfront is just one of the three reasons I moved to town. So I'm glad to see there's some movement on this. Um, I'm also familiar with what's been going on in Downing East Boston. I know some people in that neighborhood, and really it went from no person's land to um, we really got some alternative stuff going on right now to bring people in. And um, the green space you're talking about with that virtually a human-made drumlin um, is a good place. And all the, I get to see parallels with Millennium Park, is it, down in West Roxbury? Exactly. They took a landfill and with the same idea, and because of all the uh, piles of um, stuff that's been thrown away, there's a natural rolling topography here now. 
and they put in a few occasional trees, a few stands of trees, but it does have athletic fields and things like that. There's no water involved, but um, I can see that replicated there. So anyway, I, I didn't attend the first one of these meetings because I had a conflict, so I hope there's no um, repetition. But no, thank you. And, um, that's, that's a very good example. Uh, the, the park in West Roxbury, there's a few others. Um, and I really like your description of it as a man-made drum one, I think. <laughs> well, look, Revere's story. Yes. Uh, yes, I was going to say that uh, several of these meetings, as well as uh, some of the uh, bike path meetings. And um, it's nice to have, I agree with Catherine on your public space, actually very nice, but I, did, I never heard the word parking anywhere in your presentation. And uh, people come. Uh, not all of them are going to be able to come on bicycles. Uh, and uh, so a couple of questions. A, more anything in here that will help me understand better about the bicycle, like the, the, the idea of coming underneath the bridge to get across the linway. Uh, also, uh, parking for the people who can't um, walk the distance for a ride bicycle. Uh, once, you know, you, they're not going to be walking around on there if they can't get there. And, place to park. Uh, myself, I think that the um, the community college, I don't know if that's what they call themselves now or not, but they were community college, so they started in with the community, um, to at least allow parking on the weekends and there were very few parking lots, especially on Sundays. And that Sundays is when people tend to go and walk. Yeah, it's, empty. it's empty, then. And it's, right. well, it's empty. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something we can force them to do or we can negotiate or whatever, but that's, I guess my question is, can you get people, we got the things there maybe someday, but how do we get the people there and those problems? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the question for those of you who might not have heard was, um, if this is a destination, where are people going to park? How are they going to get here? Um, the open space plan, and I, and I regret that we didn't put a sort of a general slide up of it, um, has identified some very specific locations. Um, one, is, one is right here. I think another one is right here. And there's work on creating uh, some parking right here as well uh, for access to the fish pier. Uh, I believe there's some parking uh, by the ferry terminal that is not so heavily used. Um, one thing we have a lot of in this area is space. Um, and the open space plan has incorporated a lot of uh, places for that to happen. I think it's very, very important um, that those parking spaces are easy to find, that uh, when people arrive there, they feel safe, they feel close to the park that they want to be near or close to the waterfront. So uh, that's a good point that you raise. Is there a connection under the bridge there? You said there was a connection under the bridge. Well, they bridge. talked about that. I heard it. I mean, I heard it's it. been under under discussion. It isn't mm -hmm. super high on earth. <laughs> it's technically extremely difficult mm -hmm. uh, based on the condition of the bridge and how all this is engineered and so on and so forth. Um, it has been discussed. I don't think it's a central idea quite yet. So is this is mostly about the open space. Who's going to own the open space? Is it going to be the city? Is it going to be the state? Is it going to be owned by the developers who are developing? How's that working out? Well, the open space will be a series of open spaces. Right. Um, if you want to look at these green areas, these would be owned by a private developer, but would uh, <coughs> their Chapter 91 license be required to be accessible in some measure, at least in terms of a, a sort of harbor walk. Um, DCR has been the entity that's, that's uh, developed a lot of the open spaces on top of landfills to date. Um, I'd, I, I don't want to make promises on their behalf, but I'd say that uh, that might be a potential let's call it owner or developer of, of some of the, the much larger open spaces. So um, we know that GE National Grid and uh, most recently ExxonMobil has a, had an interest in well, uh, ExxonMobil, particularly because AJ Haley sued them. Um, 
question is there going to be a transparent structure by which uh, distributions perhaps from the benefit that GE National Grid will and ExxonMobil will see with this development plan for the community in which their technology will be optimized? I'm not sure I fully understand. Um, yeah. The potential waterfront plan includes a blue line extension, possibly by Bombardier, former Exxon local board member, um, Marion National Grid, Grid, and possibly also a GE Energy Storage. So the question, given that this is our community, is when these corporations see benefit from these, these movements, how transparently, by structure, will the community see proceeds from those benefits for the corporations? Especially considering the fact that it's our tax dollars uh, through DCR potentially um, that will be helping with these developments. So I don't know if there's any discussion of um, public benefit coming from those corporations for the blue line or other things. I don't. I'm not aware of any discussions along those lines. I think if there were, you could think about some of those benefits accruing. On the waterfront, uh, that would probably be the subject of further discussion within the city, but I'm not aware of any plan but for that. From a regulatory standpoint that the city has power over, um, there should be a structure going forward that's open, transparent about how distributions should be distributed. That should be a stipulation of corporations to see benefit from developments in length. So generally, um, in terms of public benefit, let's say beyond what might be required through, let's say, a Chapter 91 license, uh, those, those open space benefits, the Harbor Walk, that kind of public access would just be mandated through that process. Right. So, We're not talking about that. So like things, the corporations relative to the things over and above that, I don't know precisely how those um, extractions either occur or how they're kind of um, communicated to the public. So hard for me to speculate on how that would relate to what we're doing here. Right, that would have to be a regulatory <coughs> stipulation from the city of Atlanta. Right. About the uh, transportation, some people mentioned about what was the public transportation as opposed to, I think you said oil and cars and things. Well, I know that you and Cap is thinking about expanding and having a townhouse style double level uh, cap. So they have that much more room for cap. People want the cap around instead of worrying about a car. That would be good to Yes. As a local builder, I have a question in regards to the expected number of available housing that this will create. And you had mentioned that it is very unlikely that any of it will be affordable housing. You can stand on that a little bit more. Because that is definitely a need. Not only housing, but also affordable housing is needed in the city. Uh, I understand, and we've been asked to specifically look at whether the city should be looking to some of this private development as also providing affordable housing. Um, our economic development advisor, Pam McKinney, has run performers on these projects. She understands this market. She's, um, she's estimated what the profit margins look like, um, and to be very blunt, they're a lot thinner than you think, and probably not enough to support meaningful amounts of, of affordable housing. Um, you know, this conversation is not over in terms of how affordable housing gets constructed in Lynn. Uh, the city may need to redouble its efforts to get 100% affordable de developments done with public subsidy, either state subsidy or other kinds of subsidy. That might be one approach. Um, but the question of how much uh, we can rely on private development to subsidize that uh, is so far not clear. And then the other question is, what is the what do you guys expect or the proper number of what the available housing is part of the So I believe some of the proposals that we have right now, at least for some of these sites, help me out, Andrew, are totaling in the um, 1,200 unit range. Um, that's just at this end. Um, the GE site is 
1,500. Um, so those are the things that are um, at least out there in the sort of proposal phase. Uh, we don't, we're not developing them, so we're not targeting them. Um, but I think it's the, the market for this housing is probably, um, it's over 100% area median income. In other words, it would be above average uh, median income. I think that's just the, the economics of what it, you know, those, those who would want to live here, what it costs to actually build these projects in order for them to pay for themselves, et cetera. It's how the, how the math pencils out. Yes. Is this a five, 10, 15 year master plan? Is this, I mean, you have meetings fairly quickly, but how do you envision the process being drawn up? I know it's up to developers to when and where they want to do development, but in your point of view, what is your high in the sky hopes for achieving this? That's the first question. And the second question, related to the parking and people who don't have transportation, would a consideration of walkover bridges over the limway to include residents who are, you don't want to create a wrong side of the track type of community where it's landlocked only for those who have actually lived in that area. So they'll enjoy the walkway, they'll enjoy the amenities, but how do you incorporate the rest of the city being able to traverse to the areas? Um, I wouldn't recommend pedestrian walkways because those can be even more isolating and dangerous. Um, I think really the best way to create the connectivity is, I'm gonna go back to it, another slide. Have you ever walked across the limway? <laughs> no, because you have to run across the limway. I agree. <laughs> Which is why we- have to run across the five mile an hour speed the way they drive today. Which is why we have um, five miles an hour and five miles an hour. We think there's room to identify some specific crosswalks or areas that could be improved. And there are things that you can do to make those more comfortable for pedestrians, uh, such as curb extensions that make the walk shorter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, DCR did a whole study about uh, improving all the intersections along the line. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure everyone wants to wait until there's money to have that completed. We think that there may be opportunities to increase uh, the, the, the quality of a select few number of intersections as a way to begin this process of making the waterfront more accessible. And, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the timeline, is this a 5, 10, 15 year master plan? So we, we think it's gonna, it's gonna happen in, in phases, right? We think that this, what we're showing here, uh, with some development proposals to the south, the north, that this is gonna happen first in the next, I don't know, two to five years. Um, these phases, um, <coughs> quite frankly, might be longer, might be in the 10 to 15 range. Um, it's very hard to predict the market uh, and what the demand will be or how uh, some of these developments will either <coughs> accelerate or, or hinder future development. You know, it's hard to know whether there's a supply and demand effect that happens. But uh, we think that this is, a, this is a plan, this is a guiding plan that will need to be sort of refreshed and updated as private development occurs along the way but it's uh, meant to provide enough guidance that we can um, amend the municipal harbor plan, amend the zoning to reflect some of this vision. Okay, last one. Um, so is the planning that you're doing taking into account um, climate change and possible sea level rise and the existing flooding on the other side of the river? Yes, um, the, it, it's, a lot of that is really covered by the private entities that will be developing these lots. Um, they are, uh, among other things, motivated by self-interest, obviously. Um, I think in some cases there's some applicability of uh, FEMA regulations that will force them to develop uh, appropriately. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that is, but um, <coughs> there are some, um, one of the big issues is the, the 
you know, the seawall here has eroded. And um, that's a question mark in this plan is how and who and when that gets repaired. The designs currently for the engineering of the, the new cap for the landfill includes some very extensive reinforcing along the bottom parts of that mound um, to protect from sea level rise and storms and, and that sort of thing. But that needs to be supported also by some sort of improved uh, waterfront protection there. So that's, uh, that's an unknown, but something on the list. That no, that's, thank you. I just wanted to comment, too, that we, we need affordable housing here, really affordable housing. And I understand that the current numbers don't work, but I urge you not to <coughs> um, that need. You know, I think the state is realizing how <coughs> monies need to be spent on affordable housing, and I think there may be other innovative financing mechanisms that could be available to support some affordable housing so we don't have a high-end ghetto along the shore. Yes, understood. Uh, yeah, um, is there some sort of infographic that would show uh, <coughs> what amount of revenue this, these developments would bring to the city? I think there's still a lot of anxiety for folks in the community about what these developments would do. Is there a plan to show that, hey, building this will bring a tax amount of tax dollars to the city of Atlanta? Uh, that would be a very useful piece of information. We don't, I don't think we've done that calculation. Um, it would depend a little bit on the rate of taxation and assessment and a bunch of other variables, but um, that might be an interesting thing to understand because um, in addition to what we hope are immediate benefits of public open space and access, um, you know, one of the other benefits that development brings is tax base to the city to support other things that may not be in this area, like schools and roads. And yeah, because I think, you know, this, when you talk to a lot of people around here, there's a lot of anxiety, they're paying a lot of rent, and if we could show that, I think that would go a long way in making folks feel comfortable. Until then, we're just going to believe that it's in this place. Yep. Mm -hmm. The refer to the ferry terminal and the bathroom and parking lot. Why don't we push to get the ferry? And then we might have, granted, the governor said it didn't pay for itself. Of course it didn't. It was a commuter ferry. Put it in in the middle of the day. Do what Salem did. Then you'll get all those small shops that might decide, oh, the ferry's there. Let's open some businesses right there. We're ignoring the whole fact that we paid all that money for a ferry terminal. terminal. Even the boats can't go in there. There's nothing in there. Have a restaurant or something there for the boats to pull up to. It's all accessible. They dredged it. They did all that work. And it's used to useless. So I, I think it would be fabulous if we could get the ferry in. Um, we don't control the MBTA budget or the state budget, but... Um, but we should at least complain that if it will put in during the day, during the hours other than commuter, <laughs> it would pay for itself. I, I think this planning effort is at least, if nothing else, uh, a, a way for the city to make an even stronger case to bring it back. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from the New Lynn Coalition. We're a coalition of organizations in the city, and one of the main things we're working on right now is the housing situation, the housing crisis in our city. So I'm sorry for just uh, credentialing myself for a quick second, but if anybody wants to continue this conversation about affordable housing after this meeting, I really encourage you to stick around and maybe meet outside for a quick few minutes and have, continue this conversation. Uh, I'd also really like to thank you for coming back and for incorporating a lot of the ideas that our organization and other organizations that we work with across the city brought to you at the last public meeting. It's nice to see a planning process that's actually listening to the people in this city in a real way. Um, I just want to point out that uh, rents in the city have gone up uh, 20 to 25% over the last two and a half years. Uh, we're seeing people who can no longer afford to live where they, where they grew up. On top of that, uh, in the map you had showing the potential buildings uh, in the white, I can't remember exactly which slide it was. Uh, that, all right. So you have the GE gear plant built up as the gated community that's been proposed. The building 19 site, uh, which is where the Linway Mart is now, built up this private development. Um, the Riverworks train station is inside of that gated community that's been proposed at GE. I heard someone say, uh, I had a ghetto outside, someone say uh, a wealthy city on the other side of the tracks, very literally. 
Um, and that's something that I know we're all committed to not seeing in the city. Um, even private development on private land has been getting subsidies. Uh, I think there is a lot of creative opportunities for funding and financing. Um, but specifically with regards to the River Works Station, because I think that's a really clear example of how something that should be in the public realm is being privatized for wealthy people and who are coming to our city and not from the city. Is there anything in your plan that ensures that there would be access to Riverworks by the public? It's not used for GE in the way it used to be anymore, so there's no reason for that to remain uh, private. And then a uh, second question is, is there anything in the environmental piece of this plan that would address the algae uh, that really impacts only the wind side and not really the hot side of Long Beach? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a plan for the algae, but uh, if we can learn a little bit more about what causes it, um, that's something that we can at least consider. Um, in terms of uh, the GE site, it's really not part of our um, study area. Um, I believe this plan is the, the framework of that plan has more or less you know, been determined probably even before we started. Um, I'm not sure how that station gets constructed. I suspect that they, the, the developer will have to pay for it or pay for a lot of it. Um, so I can't speak to how private or not private that would be. Um, again, what we're looking at are ways to, with the tools that we have and the area that we have, can we make these intersections or crossways a little bit better, a little bit more, uh, a little easier to use for the public, and um, more accessible both physically and, let's say, um, socially? Uh, so many uh, questions that uh, would come up, and the big question that I have is the uh, the. Uh, Developments that you said that there's low margins to for developers to come in and to make a uh, profit. I'm not sure what they're uh, margining on, and are we looking at zoning where we would go up higher so we could have some zoning that would include higher buildings to create more housing and also to put a plan in place where we have an affordable housing plan, whether it's on site our off-site where a developer comes in to create some housing and then you know hold them to the fire to say, all right, we're gonna put so many units up, maybe we'll create some affordable housing in a different part of the city. That's one of the uh, uh, questions I have in mind. The other thing that I have, uh, based on your last public hearing, you said to bring some ideas to the table at this next hearing. Is there any uh, vision for uh, renewable energy on these uh, sites. If you have uh, public access, you have uh, uh, going to create a walkway. Is there any idea to have a walkway with perhaps a roof, solar panels along these walkways? Is there any talk of windmills along the uh, the causeway or in the Lynn Harbor to create wind and solar energy? And as well as the uh, North Shore Community College site, which has a, a, a prime piece of land. I know it's right there on the other side of the Linway, but I can envision much taller buildings to create more views for more people and to get people down over there. So I think to the, the question of tall buildings, I don't think that they are uh, precluded right now. I think that one of the current proposals here is eight, nine, ten, 11 stories. Well, it, you know, that's minimal from what my vision so, is. Uh, Fif 15, I was just down at the uh, seaport yesterday and uh, counting the number of uh, stories on Fan Pier. There's buildings right there in Boston that are 15, they don't look that high. <laughs> now, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Is there anything to exceed 10 or 11? Is there a vision to go from like the, uh, the boat launch on the other side of the, uh, uh, the uh, marina and the uh, yacht club there to take public access all the way along that uh, North Harbor site on the South, uh, so the, South the, Harbor. The, we could certainly ask whether actually allowing even greater height is feasible. There's a certain point at which it's not, it's not feasible for the developer, it's not optimized. So for instance, 
the, um, the former, the Minco site, as it used to be yeah. called, is uh, actually much lower. And the reason it's lower is because it uses a, a, a wood frame construction at a height limit that's actually more efficient and uh, at the end of the day, more affordable. Um, once you get taller than that, uh, you cross an expense threshold where your construction costs get more, much greater, even on a per square foot basis, et cetera, et cetera. So the economics change in a way that um, is different. Have you looked at any sites that are within uh, a proximity to Boston along the East Coast that has such an, uh, an economic opportunity where we are so close to the city of Boston, if you look at Miami, New York, Washington, up along the East Coast, is there anything that you've compared to to say, why not go higher? And why not cross that bridge to go steel and... Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the plan that we, the 2008 plan that we're officially updating now, had a vision for high rises all along this district. That was the vision. Um, none of it's happened because it's not feasible. There isn't a market demand for that kind of product yet. There may be in the future, but you can't just build it and they will come. Um, we are looking at allowing certain heights that the uh, chapter 91, the state level regulations, limit how close that height can be to the water. But there's plenty of room for height in this district uh, if there's an appetite for it. I'm not sure that it will make a difference to the development. Yes. Uh, some of this, these might be a little premature, but um, how many private owners are on this piece of land here uh, currently? Which the entire district? Yeah. Uh, I don't know offhand, but what, 10, 15, 20, thereabouts? 20. And, and is this going to be developed by one entity or several? No, mul multiple private entities. Roughly how many would you say? Well, the, the, the plans that are uh, at least on the boards right now, are uh, three different entities. Three different. And is any of this land that is going to have the private development on it currently publicly owned? No. None of it? Well, isn't there a sliver down here owned by the MG, uh, PCF? There's a sliver, but um, they are proposing a swap so that the, the D DCR piece can remain public and remain on the outer edge, and then the development can occur in the middle of the site. And last last thing is the, um, the subsidies you were talking about, the potential subsidies you may require. Just tax breaks, is that what you mean? Are there on the other kind of subsidies? No, no, no. By subsidies, we mean um, ways in which the private development can support or make a contribution to public benefits as part of their permitting process. So for instance, open space amenities that can be used by the public, um, things of that nature. So I don't think we were talking about the public subsidizing the projects. It was the other way around. Uh, I was wondering, yeah, we went on the walks last summer that followed all this land. And we were literally stunned at how much space there is there. Some of the public had views and how real beautiful it We lived here 40 years. We had not a clue that that existed down there. But we were saddened to see the condition of the Heritage State Park. When our children were young, you know, they're over 30 now, but that was a very vibrant park where they had paddle boats, they had the fireworks there a few years, they had um, I think a city employee who um, did all these festivals on the weekends, cultural festivals. It was such a vibrant place. And, and now it is literally the pavement is falling apart. It's a total shame to see how that has gone downhill. Are there any immediate plans as a part of, say, the two or five year plan that something can be done with that space? Because it seems something can be done relatively. And there's a very small parking lot there, but again, the community college used to let people park there and could always walk the walk. Like literally hundreds of people used to go there for the fireworks and the weekend festivals. So it's really a shame what has become of it. 
I think there is part of the extension of the open space plan. There is a plan to more specifically to uh, upgrade the Lynn Heritage State Park. Is that owned by the state? Is that owned by the CCR and the state of four city employees running it? Yes. Yes. It's owned by the state. Um, I, I don't think anyone from the open space team is here tonight to speak in more detail about it, but I, I'm pretty certain that uh, there are plans that they are hoping to firm up that would specifically uh, improve that part. <coughs> see if anyone else see if anyone else has asked. Yeah, <laughs> you. The public park area that you talked about is a critical piece of this this entire plan, and it's something that uh, I, I believe should be uh, prioritized because what it does is give people a vision of what's there. That's, that doesn't happen very often in the planning process. You know, I know that we haven't been in that for quite some time, so. so. You know, if, if that can be prioritized along with it, and, and I like the way you addressed the point about the, uh, the intersections that we can handle. I mean, there are other parts of the world that deal with this issue quite nicely. You know, how to get people across roadways like the Linway. Well, I think we can do it as well. And if we can do that, I think that will uh, provide that kind of uh, space. Another point, you know, Sean's point about um, you know, heights and the like, as long as we're not precluding uh, options for developers, I, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, you know, the state in many instances uh, back in the 70s and 80s went a little too far with, with some of the rates, and you know, they have backed off some of them. And that's been because of pressures in places like Boston. That's it. So as long as we're not, uh, uh, it's not, as long as we're not being too restrictive in that regard, I think that the market will take care of that issue because the market always does. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good point and I think you captured a little bit the spirit of what we're trying to do which is to um, create a plan that is flexible, um, that's firm enough to ensure that the really important assets like the open space and those other sorts of benefits um, are implemented but that the other pieces are flexible enough um, to permit growth and to encourage and to attract growth. And to that end, um, I believe the current zoning allows for quite a bit of height, but we will we will revisit that question in more detail because we will be making <coughs> zoning recommendations. Again, one of the limiting factors is um, height is not only regulated by the local zoning, it's, it's also regulated by Chapter 91, the state level regulation in terms of your proximity to the water, but um, there's no reason that we can't look at it at least allowing. Uh, yeah, look at all these developments we have going on, 1,200, 1,500. There's going to be enough revenue that's going to support the schools, fire, police. I mean, it seems like they're already searched in pretty, pretty tight, especially in the school system with, uh, you know, 25, 30K classrooms. I think they're going to have a lot more kids coming. Um, I can't speak to the, those impacts of these developments. They're already, they're just out there as proposals right now. Um, uh, you raise a good point that there are, there are impacts um, that probably have to do with schools, roadways. I think that they do traffic impacts analyses as part of their plan. That's a whole other question for Linda. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, they will just, so people understand, I believe they, they do have to pay for utilities and other things that get extended to their site. Um, uh, water and sewer uh, is actually very happy about the possibility of having some new customers, particularly because they're losing Gorelick Farms, which is, um, I think, 7% of their revenue. So, um, you know, they're, they're not worried about the capacity at all. I wanted to speak to that uh, relative to clean tech since I did bring the society plan to the public and I wrote it myself as far as actual uh, clean tech implementation supporting it. Um, there is a huge plan for clean energy development um, in the city of Lynn. And per the plan, there definitely will be cost reductions for housing. And those cost reductions should definitely be uh, reducing taxes for the general public. 
and including algae oil, possibly from Exxon, and algae harvesting on the water, including blue line extension, um, including GE Power and National Grid, since they have the right away. Uh, this is public information. I can share the slide deck with anyone because I wrote it. Thank you. Okay, please so just look for someone who hasn't, who hasn't asked a question. This is very important, though, because that is the end of the question. Okay, one minute. Okay, one minute. All right. Ms. Uh, Dane asked you about the, the housing thing. And for the next meeting, I'd like to request to, to I know you've done a beautiful job on it. But I know, I know obviously the planning is to agree on our grants and our advocates to all be living together in the future. And, you know, people keep skirting it by saying, well, long one free school, I'm in 80 apartments or I'm in 80 condos, and this and that. Well, uh, Jasmine, uh, what's his name there? Bertrand Jasmine, very overtired, falling asleep a real, real lot. And I would really hope for the next meeting to talk about the housing that has for all the folks, you know, the whole family living around each other next door or in very large houses, something that makes sense so they don't have to go to sleep with her, where she just get a nap over there for the rest of the time. Please, I urge for the next meeting to focus a little bit on that house. And they asked you, and I would not, you know, do anything except give the same answer as you. I know that you're very, uh, you know, effective. So they would say, that's right, Jeffrey. You need to focus on that. And I heard a lot of people kind of jumping around with it. How big are we going from the height of the apartments and everything else? It isn't working. I think we'll get to the end. We can't run about it all day. And as we have our grandpa shaking his trees, right? And they can say we did a beautiful job with my grandma to the Chicago Fire. So, uh, you know what, please, for the next meeting, I urge you to really bring that to the uh, planning of the housing. Yes. And everywhere else, God love you. Thank you. Yes. To okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, after you, please. Oh, me? Yes. Oh, Harrington's Park. Uh, we went to a meeting recently, not going to own that, that the state is supposedly going to improve that whole thing and walk through it over to Perry. Uh, improve Harrington's Park. That is in the worst way that it works, I think, because they're making the sound and dredging and doing all kinds yep. of yep. things. So, so I'm I glad think you. That will be an improvement. Thank you for confirming that. So that's what I understood. I didn't want to overpromise, but I. Um, well, we've been watching. And I don't have all the detail on it, but I think there's something underway. Yes. I'm just going to stand up again since there's a lot of other noise. Um, has there been any talk around recommendations around districting in Lynn, considering that? Uh, we have Ward 6 and Ward 5 primarily represented in this area, and adding 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 units, that's adding as many, if not more, voters than currently exist in that in that ward. So are we talking about creating a new waterfront ward? Are we talking about just completely uh, redoing the district thing in our city? Is, is that something that's been considered or talked about at all? Um, we haven't discussed it, so no, it hasn't been considered, but um, it's something that we can bring up to the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, but it's not a, you know, it's, it is a lot of people. Um, I tell you what, if there's uh, no other big questions, uh, Andrew and I will stand around. We'll stay here if people want to talk informally.